This is Internet Marketing. Hello and welcome to the Internet Marketing Podcast brought to you by Site Visibility. With me today is Robert Nickel, founder of Rocket Station. And we're going to be discussing how to use VAs to scale your business. Welcome to the podcast, Robert. Scott, thanks for having me. Love your show. Super appreciate you you having me on and, and appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. So I know you have this mixed background in real estate and then also in virtual customer service and building virtual or remote teams. And I'm just really interested to know how that story evolved over time. So can you maybe describe to me how I know you're still involved in real estate, but then how did that match up with customer service and when did Rocket Station really come to fruition? I think that's a valid question and uh, <laughs> it seems like a pretty big gap between the two. Uh, but really, there's there's a strong connect and one led directly into the other. So I, I gr- had a business degree in college and whenever I graduated, I thought I was going to climb the corporate ladder and be a big executive of some Fortune 500 company and, and rule the work world from a management standpoint. And um, the the real world, my, my corporate job, the realities of what that was and what that looked like really kind of hit me square in the face. I, I you know, didn't... There was a lot of things I didn't like about the constraints of a normal uh, corporate job. And I, you know, I had different ideas of what I wanted my life to be. I wanted to be able to play with my nephews when I wanted and go on vacation and kind of have freedom and control over my own time to live the life that I wanted to to do. And I figured out pretty quick that the traditional corporate path wasn't going to give me the freedom that that I was really looking for. So I jumped into real estate because I you know, had seen all the TV shows and read all the books and all the blogs and all the podcasts about real estate and how easy it is to go flip houses. And so I jumped into the traditional uh, investing side of real estate where I was buying houses, fixing them up and reselling them on the on the open market and it was good but scott it was it was a nightmare in that it was taking significantly more of my time to do a few real estate transactions than it was in my my corporate job so i was making more money but i was to be totally candid with you a total disaster in my day-to-day i was pretty good at a few different things i was great at meeting with sellers i was great at the sales piece i was great at networking and, and marketing Uh, I was not good at back office support. I was not good at bookkeeping. I was not good at customer service. I was not good at all the day-to-day task management that it took to to really run the business. And so uh, to make a very long story short is I went through all the the struggles, trials, tribulations, and failures of trying to, to build and manage teams. I tried to hire friends and family. And I failed at that. I was a terrible manager and, and just awful at, at hiring friends and family. I was I tried to then hire some remote and virtual teams initially, and I totally failed at that. And I dreaded driving into the office every single day. And so I instead of having a business that that served me, I served my business every single day. And I was working 80, 90 hours a week and just grinding every single day. And just like all the Facebook memes that you see of people, you know, in the gym at 4am and, and then work until till midnight, that, that was me, but that was not the point of starting my own business. So I was lucky to have some really great mentors. And I went and talked to, to a, a real estate um, broker in North Texas, who was here in the States, who was just amazing, had an awesome business and an awesome team. And a family and he was his he was his daughter's caddy for every golf tournament that she had and he was building go-karts in the garage with with his son and he had this amazing life plus a much better business than what I had and so I went to go talk to him to kind of figure it out and he had really kind of mastered what it took to hire and manage virtual teams remotely from not just the United States, but from all over the world. And that's where I first really started to learn about the concept. This was 2011, 2012. Learn about the concept of how to hire and manage remote teams, virtual teams from all over the world. I kind of perfected the that process for myself. I helped a ton of real estate investors, almost 100 of my, my real estate investor friends 
kind of figure out this virtual staffing model. And once I kind of like perfected the process and helped enough people do it, we it kind of just fell into my lap to that this was a business. This is something that not only I needed for myself, but any entrepreneur, any small to mid-sized business needs to be more efficient, needs to be more productive, needs to be more profitable. So it was just an easy thing for me to see that everybody needed the solution to the same problems that I was facing day to day. So that's what Rocket Station is today, is it's just the easy button for hiring productivity, managing teams, systems, and process documentation. Thinking back 10 years ago, so when you first really started to learn of this space and yeah, get into this space for the first time. Can you maybe describe how it's different from it, how it is today? There have been some changes to technology and some of the platforms, but yeah, I'm really interested to know how the platforms maybe have changed or how the accessibility to remote workers has changed over the last 10 years. There's been some incredible advancements the last 10 years. So whenever I first started, many of the platforms today that have merged and created some incredible synergies and really kind of grown and advanced the technology and the platforms that exist weren't really there. So Fiverr at the time, everybody's or most people are familiar with, with Fiverr. And that's what they think of when they think of delegating small tasks. But Fiverr at the time was just logos and you couldn't spend more than $5 on anything during the time, it wasn't what it is today. And uh, Upwork today is this massive outsourcing platform. But at the time, it was Odesk and Elance, and they were two separate platforms, and they were competing. And so the opportunity and the technology that existed 10 years ago, you just had to work a whole lot harder. The platforms existed. The opportunity was there, but it was just a whole lot more work. You had to use a whole lot more tools. The technology wasn't near as advanced. And today, it's pretty amazing because the, the technologies progress so much that you can run virtual teams, whether you're just here in the US or you're, you're running a global team, you can make it feel and function exactly the same way as if you have a brick and mortar office. Your, your sphere, your customers, your clients, your contractors, everybody that you engage with and interact with, the entire world outside of your team has no idea whether or not you have an office, whether or not your team members are sitting there in that space or not. So that's kind of the biggest difference over the last 10 years is you can legitimately create a virtual office where your sphere of influence has no idea whether you have a a brick and mortar office or your teams are working remotely or not. So the opportunity to create an efficient, profitable, seamless business that's fully integrated, that is completely remote is so simple and doable today in 2021. And it was just a lot harder to pull off 10 years ago. And in those early years, you talked about how you were learning the skills and growing companies through hiring remote teams. But eventually that did lead to Rocket Station. So I'm just interested to know, maybe can you talk through that part of your journey? When did you decide, actually, I'm going to go into this full time. Did you reach a moment where you felt that you had a level of confidence or a formula to get to that stage where you then wanted to do it for basically any business? Yeah, it's it's funny you use that word formula because my mm. my failures were totally around not having a process. There was no formula, there was no structure for success. So I would feel pain in in the real estate business my phone was ringing all day long and then there was people expecting things for me to follow up and I just had so many things happening, so much going on in the day to day that I knew how to do everything and I knew where I was feeling pain, but there was no structure to my business really at all in that nothing was written down. There was no formula as far as systems and processes. There was no screen recording. There was no structure for anybody to really be able to help me and support me. And so most of my hiring failures, whether it was hiring friends and family to come into the office or it was hiring remote and virtual teams, I failed no matter how I tried to structure it. And I realized is because I didn't have a formula like you're talking about. I didn't have a system or, or process in place. And so my journey in perfecting this process 
was really around putting structure and a formulaic approach to making that happen. And so Rocket Station today has a three-step process that we put every client through, whether you're a publicly traded company or you're a single member LLC. And that comes from the the grind of the last 10 years of really figuring out what it takes to have success in each individual role. And we did our Q1 review that went back through 2020 um, last month, and we have a 96% placement rate. That means 96% of the first hires that our client makes sticks for a long term for that account. And the way that we have long term success, 96% of the first try is because of a formulaic approach. And it's, I'll just give you the high level real quick about what exactly that process is. And, and most people go about the process the way that I went about it, which was backwards. You feel pain, you throw someone at the problem, and then you try to just manage them by through task management day to day and get to the outcomes. And then most people fail in that process. They hate managing teams. They feel like that it's hard to find good people and they don't really ever get the outcomes that they're really looking for. And we think that that's just a backwards approach. If you start with defining systems and processes, literally going through every step of every task and creating a structure for what it takes to complete that task. So for me, I knew how to answer the phone. I knew what to say. I knew how to follow up with colleagues. I knew how to do all those things. But if somebody came into the office and I was trying to teach them how to answer the phone, or I was trying to teach them how to build the new marketing campaigns or set up um, you know, our Facebook ad campaigns, whatever it was, there was no structure to that process. I would just, I call it osmosis training. They'd have to come sit down next to me and I'd just have to teach them all day long, one task at a time, which created a ton of the frustration. And so the first thing that we do with every single one of our clients is we get aligned with your business. We know end to end, we want to know what your team looks like, what systems and processes that you have in place currently, what kind of software are you using, what tools and resources do you currently have in place? And from there, we can build a roadmap. We can really put a lot of structure in place and define what success looks like. So long before we ever want to hire anybody, we want to put a lot of structure, systems and processes and a foundation in place for somebody to be able to come in and and ultimately have success. So the first thing we do is we get aligned to understand end to end. And for my real estate business, that was pretty simple, but it's it's no different for a marketing company or any other business. It's just having a full, clear picture end to end of what's happening day to day in the business. Then we actually build systems and process for every task that's happening. So that is a combination of screen grabs, that's screen recordings, that's videos, that's beautiful PDF documents with with um, images and arrows that show you step by step exactly how to do every task. And once you have a clear system and process document for every task within the business, hiring becomes so much easier because now you've got a real clear profile of who you're trying to to hire to fill those roles. You know, in in the marketing world, the the data side is very different than the creative side. So someone who's going to create, you know, the graphics, images, videos, that's a different skill set and job description than someone who's going to set up the campaigns and run the reporting and pull the data and and draw analysis and and pull information from what that reporting and that what that data is telling you. It's very different skill set. So we want to usually have a very different person that's going to fill that role. So the way you have hiring success is by, I know this is way too long-winded answer of your question, but that formula, that structure is by starting with the end in mind, documenting everything that's happening, and then you hire to those roles. And now getting the right person in the right seat becomes so much easier. And then creating a formula for management success where you're managing to to outcomes and KPIs and not to tasks becomes so much easier. So that process, those steps is the process for, for success. And we walk every one of our clients through that exact same process. And it doesn't matter whether you have, we have accounts with over 4,000 employees and we have some accounts that have, you know, just a couple employees or it's just them as a, as a single member LLC. It doesn't matter the size of your business. Everybody goes through that same process and that's what essentially guarantees hiring success. And the thoroughness of your answer also indicates to me the the diverse set of skills required to actually create a process. When people think about process and when you just talked about your history there, 
I think of the organization skills that are required, but I also think about the observation skills, the research skills. And so I'm interested to know of those skills that I just mentioned there, what skills came naturally to you, but which of the skills did you really have to work at over time and how did you improve those skills? Oh, that's such an interesting question because what we are really good at as a business, all the things that you just mentioned, being very thorough, research, mm-hmm. detail-oriented, having tons of structure, our database, there's there's not really a system software CRM or database out there that our team is not truly experts in at this point. And all of those types of tasks are what I am terrible at, Scott, like me personally. So the back office piece, the detail orientation, the structure, all the systems and processes that it takes to make a business amazing, that's where I was awful. I was great at talking. So I I was great at, when I say talking, I don't mean talking. I meant sales. I mean sales. I mean uh, customer support, where I'm engaging with clients, where I can network, where I can act. Those are the types of the outward facing tasks. Those are the things that I was actually good at. We have, you know, so many of our marketing clients, they're, they're amazing at interfacing with the, the clients. They have their monthly reports or their, their bi-monthly report meetings. They're, they're amazing on those meetings and they sometimes struggle on the execution, the back end. And that was the way I was, is I, I knew how to get everything done. I, I was an expert in the process as far as I knew the process. I knew how to get things done better than anybody. But as far as the actual execution, I mean, that that's where I personally really struggled. And so Rocket Station as a company was essentially initially designed to solve all the things that I was terrible at, Scott. It was like I was not good at the day-to-day process and system implementation down to the point of I was terrible at creating system and process documentation myself. I thought it would be okay. I would create a system or scope for something that that needed to get done in the day to day. And I would hand it off for somebody to get to go do that task. And they, they couldn't ever do it, which meant that the resources I was creating were not any good because they weren't usable. Right. And so I reached out to company after company to try to get them to help me build systems and processes and scopes that could actually be used. And I had a really hard time finding it. So Rocket Station in many ways is just the solutions to the problems and the pain that I was feeling every day as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, trying to grow, trying to get more things done that I was not good at. And so I needed a solution to solve those problems. And so that that is really what Rocket Station is, is all the things that, that I was terrible. So all the things that you just mentioned, and I am, I'm not really personally good at any of those things. That's interesting because the benefits to Rocket Station are clear, and we'll go through them as we're talking through this episode, but the, the ability to scale and then the impact that that has on your ability to generate revenue and profit and your profitability. So efficiency and how that ties in with the monetary side of your business is really clear. But there's one aspect that you've talked through there which sounds like it's at the heart of Rocket Station, which is actually just the emotional impact of overcoming obstacles so you can achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. So I'm really curious to know from your personal perspective, you remember how that feels to go through that process and finally find a breakthrough moment where you think, oh, that thing is no longer in my way because I found a formula, I found a process, I found a solution to overcome it. And do you get the same level of satisfaction from helping business achieve monetary goals as you do work-life balance goals? Yeah. So our mission as a company is to enhance lives through better business. And sometimes that's through through monetary goals. And sometimes that some people want to make, they're great with making the exact same amount of money they're, they're making right now, but they have a better quality of life. So if they can get some of their time back and have more opportunities to, to spend more time with, with their kids and their families and be a better husband and a better wife and a better dad and a better son, then oftentimes people are great with making the same amount of money, but just having a better standard of life. So whatever outcomes our clients are looking for, we're truly a partner with them to reach those goals and outcomes. So how much fun is it for me to help our clients get to their goals and outcomes? That I don't think anybody in the world has a better job and has a better day than I do every single day because I get to wake up and help people reach their goals and reach their dreams. And, and to me, business is just a vehicle. It's just a tool 
that's supposed to serve your life, right? And it's not supposed to be the other way around where you serve your business all the time and then sometimes get to live your life. No, an, an amazing business, an efficient, profitable, scalable business is one that serves you and all that, whatever that means, you know? And, and again, sometimes that's money. Sometimes people are looking to make a lot of money, which is great. I, I like money too, but but oftentimes it, it's it's usually about quality of life. And so to me, there's nothing more fun than helping people get there. And that is because to answer your original question about the emotional connection, mm -hmm. I am still so tied to that emotional connection that, that what freedom feels like, what it feels like to wake up in the morning and be excited about driving into my office, be excited about the team, be proud of what our company does every single day, both for our clients that, that are our partners and that we are invested in every single day, but also for our employees and our team members that, that we are providing an amazing platform for to, to build their life and have an incredible quality of life. That's we're, we're really built to serve both our team members and our clients. And that all for me comes back to the gratitude that I feel from having the freedom and control over, over my own life. So I don't think I'll ever forget several of these landmark moments for me in my business, Scott, that allowed me the freedom to, to, to be able to kind of do what I want to do. So, you know, to be able to go to the, I went to the Virgin Islands a couple of weeks ago and left for 10 days and came home. And I didn't even tell anybody I was leaving besides one or two people in the office, just in case there's emergencies and came back and, you know, the business is just humming. It was like, I, I'd never left. Right. And that, that to me is what I'm so proud of because for so long, Scott, I was the exact opposite. I was the grinder. I was on the hamster wheel. I was working 80, 90 hours a week. And I wasn't ever sure there was going to be a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think when you walk out the door, well, you know, the last year has been a little bit different. Most people have been working from home. But whenever, regardless whether you're working from home or you're, you're going into an office, when you're taking that time, to leave the things that you truly care about the most, your friends, your family, your kids, the, the things in your personal life that, that you actually care about. When you go to work, when you leave, you're making a big commitment to your family, to, to the people that, that you care about and the people that you love, that the time away from them is worth it, that it's going to have a payoff, that there's a reward for that separation and all that work that's being put in. And so for me to the the grind the hustle should be seasonal that it's it's not the outcome shouldn't be to grind all the time so we to help our clients create the life that they're looking for to to serve them so that they can be the best person that they're trying to be both in the office and at home that's what i wanted for my own life and my own progression and so to be able to have some of that freedom and then be able to help people both from our team members and employees, but also our clients, serve them both and help them achieve that same quality of life. To me, I don't, I don't know what could be more fun than that, Scott. I think, I, I think I have the best life that anybody could have. Talking about the landmark moments and creating the life that you want, do you want to maybe share a couple of your favorite examples of businesses or that you've helped grow through Rocket Station or just individuals that you've helped to help to them to achieve their personal goals? Yeah. So we've got some, some amazing stories. There's a, there's a, you know, we're talking about real estate. There's a, a couple guys in Columbus, Ohio that have uh, an amazing real estate business and they are helping not only uh, middle-class Americans build retirements and create stable futures and, and retirement outcomes for themselves, but also for their own team members and this, their own team members because of the resource of things they're able to do because of how efficient their business is, are now able to create retirement portfolios for themselves. They're essentially learning from the business how efficient, how everything can work and then apply that to their own lives. So it was an amazing call we had yesterday. They just did their, their monthly review for April as a company, Columbus Home Buyers, and they called me just so ecstatic and excited because they're doing so well and they're so efficient that even their team members are able to take take some of the things that they're 
they're learning working for the company and buying some real estate, being able to put it as, as a rental portfolio and creating a retirement future that they never thought was going to going to be possible. So to create that stability for them has been pretty amazing. There's a, a couple out of um, Minneapolis who have a great e-commerce business. They're, they're marketers for Amazon, and they started on the side a nonprofit. It's a food bank for their local community, and they're using our, our team members based in the Philippines to essentially run that entire food bank and, and their charitable efforts there in Minnesota. So that was really amazing for me to see last month was, was people not only having success in their business, but that business being able to serve their communities and, and our teams being able to, to be a part of that was just really cool. And there's, there's a guy named Frank, uh, I'm going to mess up his, his last name. I think it's Scapatici. They're veterans, uh, U.S. military partners, and they do a whole lot of veteran housing. And so they're using our, our team members, our virtual assistants, to manage the back end of their company. They've gotten so efficient. They did 40 transactions last year. They're creating jobs and homes for veterans in their community. And our teams are playing a huge role in that because they're able to create a much bigger, much more efficient, much more profitable, and much more successful business than they ever could imagine. And as a result of that, it's creating jobs, homes, and opportunity for veterans within their community. So it's just been, I mean, it really has been an amazing ride to, to see the stories. Whenever I, I go online periodically and just Google Rocket Station and I read our Google reviews, because those are all organic and those are written by our clients. And, and I'm just amazed at the, the impact that our teams have on our clients' businesses every day. So I could go on and on about the stories, but from marketing companies to real estate companies and software companies and, and e-commerce and everything in between, there's some pretty incredible stories about how people are, are building amazing lives and able to serve their communities in ways they never thought possible. So I want to ask a little bit more about marketing in a moment, but you just touched on a few industries there. And one of the questions that comes to mind for me is that it feels like there are probably some industries that lend themselves more easily to scaling through virtual assistants than others. Is that true? Are there certain industries that you just think, well, just from your experience that you know are easier to scale and easier to work in using remote and virtual teams? Yeah, so really there's only a couple industries we, we've had a hard time really working. And, and that's just any time there is levels of security that makes it hard to create remote access into server softwares and databases. So we work for a financial services company. It's one of the largest in the entire world. And just setting up email accounts and, and getting teams integrated was really difficult because of the, the security protocols of having a Fortune 15 size financial advising firm. So that just from a from a systems access standpoint, that that wasn't really doable. We don't do great with hospital systems. And again, it, it mostly comes from in infrastructure. The hospital systems aren't usually uh, with the most current technology systems. So it makes it hard to integrate virtual teams oftentimes with, within those hospital systems. And then we don't do any development. So we work for a lot of software companies doing level one customer support, doing bookkeeping, inside sales, all the day-to-day -day task management. But as far as actual coding and development, uh, we don't do that. But there are, there are other companies that, that do do that. So there's only a few industries that I can think of that, that make it hard to kind of outsource and delegate. But I think through the pandemic and over the last uh, little more than the last 12 months, most companies and most industries have seen that working remotely and having virtual teams is, is not only doable, but it's every bit as efficient and, and um, profitable as, as having people in an actual office. A moment ago, you were sharing the examples, some of your favorite examples of companies that have grown using Rocket Station. And you mentioned your network of Filipino workers. And that's something that came up in my research. So I, I think I saw a note to say that you have a network of over 800 professionals, virtual assistants in the Philippines. And so the two questions that come to mind for me are why? And that's through naivety. Why the Philippines? What makes that? Yeah, what is it about Filipino workers or working that in that economy, in that environment that is useful? And then how? So 
I imagine that something was working and then you eventually decided to scout and find more Filipino workers to work with. So how then did you grow that network? Yeah, so the first part of why, it, it, it just makes all the sense in the world when you really look into it. So in the Philippines, English is a national language there. So uh, 90-something percent of the entire population, over 100 million people, speak speak amazing English. Some of them even speak British English, which is in the U.S. It's highly desirable. Americans are are very, uh, we really like, all the research shows that Americans love a British accent. It comes across as, as more friendly and people just like dealing with the, the British accent or Australian accent more. So uh, Philippines, English is a national language there. It's also a large population. So it's a, it's roughly a third of the size of the United States. So it's a very large workforce that's highly educated. So a huge percentage of the population has college degrees from reputable universities. So you've got college educated, intelligent, incredible English speaking uh, workforce that is, I think, 15 to 18% of the entire GDP of the Philippines is in BPO, business process outsourcing, which is the industry that that I am in, that the outsourcing industry when we're placing virtual teams. And so a big part of the community from an industry standpoint, a lot of the investment, a lot of the culture is built around outsourcing and BPO. So the and on top of that, Scott, it's one of the most amazing service-oriented cultures in the entire world. But as a culture, they are so friendly and fun and amicable and loving and just one of the most amazing cultures ever. In the Philippines, the, the gross domestic product, the GDP, the economy, just isn't that big. And so as a result of the economy not being that big, wages are relatively low in the Philippines. So in the Philippines, you have a really high quality workforce, super high quality workforce that on average gets a relatively very low average wage. And because of that, there's a massive opportunity, just a value that can be provided to the American workforce. So the Philippines is just an amazing culture. It's an amazing community. And many of the resources in the Philippines are designed specifically to serve small to mid-market companies, not just in the U.S., but, but across the world. So that's, that's the why. Did that, does that answer your question specifically yeah, no, that, on the that, why That's side? actually really insightful and, and fascinating. There's a lot that I didn't know there. And um, yeah, I mean, the next question was kind of how did you then build your network? And alongside that, I was curious to know, is it, do you only solely work with virtual assistants from the Philippines or do you work in other countries as well? So our teams are, we, we have a, our, we're headquartered in the United States. So we're in Dallas, Texas is where our headquarters is. And we, that's where, you know, we've got an office full of people there. But our second office, uh, we have a second headquarters in, the, in Manila. And that is, that is the only other place that we work. So our teams are, primi- are solely based out of the Philippines besides our, our U.S.-based team. And so we've got just under 100 people in support in the Philippines, in Manila, that manage just over 800 of our team members that are working for our U.S.-based clients. So the how behind that is just I I started with a couple team members, and over time, we built a really big infrastructure around recruiting and training. So today, we're screening four to 6,000 applications a month. We're hiring less than 2%. Of those people, they then come. Of those two percent that get hired, they come into our platform. There are employees, so they get full benefits and everything that any employee needs to to create a quality standard of living, so they can be productive and consistent at work. Right. So we do everything in our power to create amazing quality of life for our workers, for our employees, so that they can produce massive value for our clients. So we we have big infrastructure around recruiting. Once they come into our pipeline, they get hired. Then they're on our our platform for about eight weeks going through a training profiling screening process because we're matching perfect candidates to the right job description. We mentioned earlier how we, we are building all the systems and process docs for our clients. So that's giving us perfect insight into the, the type of person, the personality and the skill set that'll be needed to fill that role. So our teams are working in, in unison together on both 
recruiting training, as well as system and process development and placements teams. So we have a huge infrastructure that is specifically designed to create that, that seamless integration and that flow where while we're building all the resources that our clients need to be successful, our recruiting staffing placements team is also working with that, that process development team to be identifying candidate pool that's a perfect fit. So how did we go from a few to 800? A lot of hard work, uh, making a lot of mistakes and just kind of figuring it out, really. So we, we're really fortunate. And at the end of the day, Scott, I just have the most amazing team on the planet. And that's not, that's not hyperbole, right? They're, we're literally across the globe. And they're just absolutely incredible. I've at my basically only role in the organization at this point is working on the org chart and, and working on who is in leadership and in management positions and roles in the company because they're the ones that actually do all the work and, and maintain great relationships with both our clients and our employees. So um, the how is really through the empowering others the, the the my success is definitely in the agency of others so hiring amazing people amazing team members that have put incredible systems and processes in place and over the years we've just continued to refine those and and perfect those and and we've just we've grown a lot and then the other thing you know is we've got a tailwind behind us we've got there's a lot of conversation happening right now about efficiency about outsourcing about virtual teams and so it's really becoming commonplace and really becoming accepted across the globe that, that this is something that's, that's not only doable, but, but most companies should look into it. So we've been grinding a long time, and then timing is kind of working in our favor now because this is something that companies are starting to adopt. So the, the how is just kind of from many years of grinding. I, I wish I had a sexier answer than that, but that's kind of it. No, that's a great answer. And it actually leads me nicely on to an aspect of Rocket Station, which I stumbled upon in one of your uh, videos where you were talking about Rocket Station and how you operate. And I don't know so much about how it works in America to contract for freelancers. So Rocket Station offers service-based contracts, as far as I understand. And that's different to how any company can go and hire a freelancer, but then there's a lot of liability, risk, and training involved in that, which is different to the service-based contract that you offer. So I was maybe hoping you could explain what are some of the challenges for a regular business, some a regular business owner, someone that's listening to this thinking, now why do I have to go through Rocket Station? I could just go to People Per Hour or Freelancer.com or whatever the outsourcing services and find someone myself. Yeah, if, if you could maybe explain the differences and what service-based contracts mean. Yeah, most people are are familiar with a couple types of employment agreements. The first one would be a traditional employment. Uh, we call that W two here in the U.S. and that that's full employment, and that you know there you, all the rules, laws, and and human resource regulations around what employment means, right? And and most people are very familiar with traditional W two, and then the the other form of employment that most people are familiar with is just an independent contractor, or in the US, we call that a 1099. And that is just where you pay the person. They're, they're responsible for their own taxes, but there's also lots of, of rules, laws, and regulations around what that, what, how that, that relationship as a contractor can, can, can be managed, right? And so we are neither a W-2 or a 1099. Our goal is to eliminate all HR liability from, from our partners, from our clients, and make it as efficient as possible. So we, as a service contract, as a service agreement, you're paying our U.S.-based companies for hours worked and renders in arrears. So there, you're, there's no employment agreement implied there is no employment agreement whatsoever it's just a service agreement between your company and our company which eliminates all hr liability that could possibly exist within that employment agreement so with rocket station it functions like an employee meaning you're going to get this the, you're going to hire somebody in that it's going to be that same individual working for your company Every single day, the same hours, working your normal hours, where you get to control their time, you get to control what they do, you get to control all the aspects of their day-to-day and what they're doing and how they're working for you. 
but you you don't have the liability because in a 1099 agreement you can't control all of those things legally and in a, in a w2 agreement you can control all those things but you have an incredible amount of liability so we're giving you both control and relieving the liability by making that a service agreement and all the liability and all the the risk comes on to rocket station as a company and we remove that from from your company. So I hope that I didn't make that confusing and I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, that does make sense. And it naturally leads on to the next question, which can be a question from both perspectives. So let's say that I'm one of the virtual assistants and I'm just not really getting on with the company that I've been assigned to. Uh, and I know you go through all the research process to try and avoid that. I think you mentioned at the beginning a 96% success rate or something. But I'm, I'm assuming occasionally there are issues, there are things that don't work out. Maybe it's just not a good fit for either party. How do you then resolve that? How do you resolve those kind of HR issues or recruitment issues that might arise? Yeah, Scott, that's an awesome question. And and you're right. We try to eliminate any issues and be proactive about solving problems up front. And a lot of the system and process documentation, the alignment period up front, really eliminates the the potential for, for errors and, and mistakes to happen. But at the end of the day, if people are people and things can happen, like you mentioned, right? But because you've gone through that process with us, that alum, alignment phase, and then that documentation phase, we're totally aligned with your business. We're very in tune with everything that's happening. And ideally, we're reaching out to you. And this is what happens most of the time is we're proactive about reaching out about solving those problems. So turnover is never easy. It's never an enjoyable experience. But because of our relationship with our partners and, and how integrated we are, we make that as seamless as possible. So usually you can have somebody, you can go through a round of interviews, have somebody integrated and replaced in a very short period of time. And all the traditional pain of, of turnover and the, the lag and the downtime and the lack of productivity, usually that's minimized and reduced because of the, the system and processes we have in place. To where if we do have to replace somebody, it's as quick and as seamless as, as possible. So definitely happens where, where there's times where it's it's just for whatever reason. Sometimes it's just a a um you know a culture fit in that like I want our clients to enjoy their team members. I want them to enjoy who they're working with every day and be excited about logging in and, and having that team member work for their organization and represent them in their company. So if it's not a great fit, then we do everything possible to make sure and, and solve those issues. And the vast majority of the time, we, we can get that solved. It's very, very rare where there's a problem that we can't fix. I'm so glad you mentioned the word culture as well, because that's a, a burning question for me. When I think of virtual teams and virtual assistants, the unfortunate truth is that I orientate around this process and organization mindset. So I think very transactionally about the task that needs to get done and who can do it. And I know and understand how you can be successful in that. But we talked very uh, early at the beginning of this episode about how some people's goals are just to build into part of their life more, enjo- more working enjoyment, get more satisfaction out of their job. And a lot of that comes from creating the environment that you want to work in. And so my question is, do you think that you can still create a unique company culture that's true to you and true to what you want to achieve entirely through a remote or virtual team. Absolutely. And you do it the exact same way you do it when you have an office virtually, which is through intention. You're very intentional about it. Some Mm. things happen naturally when you're in an office. So, you know, if anybody who's ever worked in a traditional company in a traditional office, you know, you try to keep a secret. Right. I worked in a company right out of college where we had a policy where there was no fraternization allowed. So so colleagues wow. weren't allowed to date each other. Well, it like as soon as somebody started dating in the office, the whole office knew about it, right? Like <laughs> keeping a secret in the office was impossible. It's like communication just seemed to kind of happen and flow through a traditional office. So some of those things you just have to be a little more intentional about, but you can absolutely create the exact same amazing culture virtually as you can in in a in a traditional office. We still try to get our teams together periodically. So prior to the pandemic, we required all of our teams to get together at a minimum 
quarterly and then we do big events biannually. So usually middle of the, the summer and then right around Christmas time, we do big parties. But culture is not about the big celebrations. It's not about the big parties. It's about the daily effort that you put into to growing relationships and building and managing those teams. And that for my company, that's one of the things I'm most proud of is the the culture that we have across the organization. And we've been remote since 2013. So if, if you're intentional about the way you, you over-communicate, you leverage the tools that are available, you, you set up strong groups within your organization that, that over-communicate with clear expectations, clear alignment, total transparency about what's happening, you can create every bit, if not better, culture virtually, with a virtual organization as you can with an in-office team. And another aspect of this, which I'm really curious about, and actually ties in with this podcast and being marketing specific, is, and again, this is kind of naivety and an assumption of mine, just knowing a little bit about this space and having seen it develop over time, is the creative work. So I clearly understand how virtual assistants can be used for process-driven exercises, but not necessarily strategic or creative work. I'm just interested to know, have you seen some really good examples of maybe marketing agencies or creative companies use virtual teams to grow and scale? Oh, yeah, of course. Absolutely. And so, like you're mentioning, there's in marketing agencies and creative companies, there's kind of two sides to the companies. There's the art and there's the science. And this is the way I like to kind of think about it. Mm. And the science is, you know, the process flows, the timing, the, the, the cycles of when things have to get done, the actual posting, the management of those posts and the community engagement and, and all the things that, that you can put around. Uh, you know, and the data and the pulling the reports and the analysis. There, there's a lot of checklist and science type items within the agency. And those function just like any other company, essentially, right? And I think what you're really asking about is kind of the art side of mm. things. And, and a lot of businesses have a few different roles that have that art or that strategy component, as you mentioned. And so for us, it's just kind of a couple step process. It doesn't really matter what, whether somebody's in, because when think about virtual teams, so whether somebody's in your office, whether they're remote or they're remote, you know, within your state, your local area or across the world, like it's all about the skill set and the ability of that, that person to, to fulfill that role, right? So as a company, we, we've got a few core functions, as a company, Rocket Station, we have a few core functions that we just absolutely crush, that we put a system around, and we know that we can scale to a lot of positions with a lot of companies and perform really well. So, you, you know, all the, the science type jobs, the inside sales, customer support, level one service on, on software, bookkeeping, all of those roles, right? The other side is is we don't really place for the creatives role. So people who create the graphics, the video editing, all the art side of that. But it doesn't, just because we're not placing for that doesn't mean that you can't outsource that. So within our own company, we have our graphics and marketing team are all based in the Philippines. And I think they do an amazing job. And all of are, are not all, but a lot of our leadership. So we've got, I think, uh, nine W-2s in Dallas. And then we've got, a, they're managing 100 people in the Philippines that are managing 800 people, right? Those 100 people in the Philippines, those are management leadership positions. And they're, they're accountable for strategy. They're accountable for, for, some of them are accountable for P&L numbers and KPIs. And so the almost any position can be outsourced and can be delegated. And it, they, that could be in your local area or that could be overseas. It's really just having the same clarity structure and process that we mentioned earlier in the podcast to hire for those roles. But you can absolutely hire, not through our company, but through there's tons of amazing resources out there where those, the, the artists, the creative side within the community, I mean, there's, there's so many amazingly talented people out there that are available. And one of the cool things about the, the hiring landscape today is there's, there's more opportunities to hire than ever before. There's more candidates available, and that's globally. So marketing companies, creative agencies, they can 
absolutely outsource. We we have tons of our our marketing clients that are that are outsourcing and delegating the vast majority of the creative work. It's not done through us, but it's through different whether it's different companies or or they're hiring themselves. It's it's totally doable. And you know, with resources like Zoom and Skype and and all you know Slack and all the tools that are available, you can have a communication and a correspondence rhythm and same cadence as you have in the office. So just because we don't place those positions as a company doesn't mean that you can't outsource those. Doesn't mean that you can't find somebody in another country to do it at a fraction of the cost in your local market. It's totally, we do it within our own organization and, and we see most of our creative companies do the same thing. And um, you mentioned Zoom, Slack, and Skype there. And my final question to you before we close out today, I know at the very beginning you mentioned that this wasn't your area, this wasn't your strongest area, like the process and the framework side and the, the, the workflow side necessarily. But I assume that in Rocket Station, you must come across several tools that you prefer to create workflows, to create organization systems and processes. And yeah, to close out, have you got any that you use regularly that you'd recommend for our listeners? Yeah, so the it, it kind of depends whether you're what um, whether you're an Apple or or a PC person. But we yeah. so most of our teams are are using Apple, and there's some great resources built in, such as um, QuickTime. You can screen record everything for free. I think PC has some some um, screen record ability, which is. Yeah. The it's a great tool. It's a great resource. So people usually ask me like, "Hey, where do I start? I don't have any training. I don't have anything to help team members. Where can I start?" Well, I think a great place to start is just recording yourself and talking to your screen as you're going through through any process or any task. And so, uh, within both uh, Mac and PC, screen record tools are available. We we love to build process flows and make them visual with software so there's amazing amazing software to actually you can you know those where it's beautiful boxes that connect and then you can drill down and and make those as complex as you want and we do some amazing stuff so there some of those tools i think people some people might have heard of some of these are are like gliffy g-l-i-f-f-y lucid chart is really good i really like draw.io d-r-a-w.ro io i'm sorry draw.io and smart draw is another one there's so many of those tools that are available to actually create those process flows as far as as um, chat features so we used to use multiple tools so we used to use skype for our video calls we used to use slack for our chat and then we used a company called ring central as our voice over ip Today we use Zoom for all of those features. So, so Zoom has the ability to have chat features that functions exactly like Slack, and most people are familiar with Slack. It obviously has the video uh, calls that most people are familiar with, but it has a voice over IP component as well today. So, we use Zoom to to take all three of those. But within those platforms of voice over IP, there's some amazing companies out there. Like Ring Central is really good. Eight by eight. Um, there, there's just, there's so many really good voice over IP companies today and you almost can't go wrong. So, so whichever one you find to be most intuitive is great. Um, and, and so same way with chat. I mean, most people are familiar with Slack. Skype is free. Again, you have Zoom. And so the tools are one of the the great things about being in business in 2021 is there is so many amazing mm-hmm. tools and and for us that those are kind of the ones we we see most common. Everybody is is on some when I say everybody, most companies use some sort of CRM, whether that's Infusionsoft or you know real estate companies have usually specific, and then marketing companies and soft, software companies. Everybody's got a little bit different software stack that they use, but we're familiar with most of them and, and can help anybody through that. But the the great thing about about doing business today, one of the many great things about be, doing business today is the softwares and tools that are available are cheap and they're super powerful. So you can run entirely remote virtual organization in the same way that you could with a brick and mortar office. Yeah, that's brilliant. It takes our conversation full circle because I think one of my first questions I asked was about 
how this space has changed over the last decade. And as you were talking there, I just remembered that, yeah, a decade, I don't think a decade ago, maybe we'd be even using Slack. Um, obviously, Microsoft Teams and I know Skype was available, but nothing was in, as intuitive as it is today. So that for me takes the conversation full, full circle and has made me realize just how the communication and technology has changed over the last decade. This has been an amazing episode and thanks so much for sharing your advice today. But before I let you go, do you want to let our listeners know where they can find out more about you and Rocket Station? Yeah, our website's rocketstation.com. We've got some great information there. We're lucky to have uh, support from a few different sharks from Shark Tank and we we try to provide quality information. So um, anybody who wants to just learn more generally, rocketstation.com is a good place. I'm happy to, if it's okay with you to give an email out for our team, Lydia. for anybody who's because most of the time when we when people hear me talk, uh, I think I need to get better at talking about what we do because people often have questions and they say, I understand generally some of the concepts, but I have a hard time understanding how that can apply to me and my business and what I could use outsourcing specifically in, in my day to day in my business. So if anybody listening is like, you know, generally curious about this topic. I don't care whether you hire our teams or not, but if you have some questions, if you want to talk more with my team who are truly workforce management experts, just email Greg Brooks, B-R-O-O-K-S, brooks at rocketstation.com. Tell them you heard me on the podcast and we'll be happy to spend 30, 45 minutes with anybody answering questions, going through your business. Again, doesn't matter if you hire us or not. Just ask us some questions, go through, and we'll point you in the right direction and and support you in any way that, that we can. Brooks at rocketstation.com or just go to rocketstation.com and, and check us out there. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'll just add to that quickly as well, that I found the Masterclass series on your website really interesting just to learn more about this space. And so I'd recommend if you, you know, you're interested in the contents of this episode, whether you're looking for a virtual to build a virtual team right now or you're looking for a virtual assistant you might just be curious about this space there's some really good information in that masterclass as well so go check that out robert for now i'll just say thanks so much for your time and that this has been the internet marketing podcast 